When I sat down to do Real Illusions, I had a story in mind, and I wanted to kind of um, express the story over, over a series of records. So it's sort of a concept record, um, or a concept project, I should say, and I didn't want to uh, do it like this is the first part, this is the second part, and this is the third part, because the story and the characters uh, was evolving. So I took the basic arc of the story, and the songs on these records are used to sort of depict um, characters or events, but it's done in a very uh, shadow kind of a way in that uh, um, it's not very obvious. You know, if somebody is not interested in the esoteric storyline, there's just the music. But if they're interested in trying to find little pieces of the story, you can kind of find them in some of the lyrics, the liner notes. So the songs aren't necessarily in the right order either. Um, and Real Illusions was sort of the first installment, and uh, The Story of Light is the second installment. And my thoughts and goals on this project are eventually to do a third installment, and then after that, take all of those, all the music from those three records and maybe create like a four CD box set that has all the songs in the proper order, um, maybe lyrics in the place of some melody songs, and um, narrative. So it would really be this colossal kind of a, um, I don't like using the word rock opera, but it, it, I guess it gives a particular picture. And, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting way to kind of, um, you know, uh, express your um, thoughts on a story or on characters as you grow. Because, you know, as we go through life, our, our perspectives change and uh, uh, they're very esoteric principles in the story. So, um, you know, those perspectives can change. So it, it's kind of nice to be able to stretch it out. And it's fun, it's, you know, why not? Yeah. Well, uh, part three, I don't know when it's going to come out. It's probably not going to be my next record. Um, but. The songs, as I was saying, are depictions of characters, and certain characters and events haven't necessarily received their soundtrack yet. So the third uh, installment will be more tracks with more um, pieces of the puzzle. And uh, but when that is, I don't know. You know, I'm not I'm not worried. It's it's when, when it feels right, then it will take shape. <laughs> Well, you know, the process of making music for me and the way that I choose songs for my solo work hasn't really changed, you know. Uh, what I look for is a compelling idea. And, you know, that could come in, in many, many different ways as it does for any of us. Uh, but when an artist gets a compelling idea, sometimes they become so um, enthralled in it that, uh, you know, they, they become myopic. You know, and you just have to get this done. So that's the approach. Every record, every song on every record had to be compelling enough for me to say, okay, I have to do this. And as a result, my records have songs that are very diverse. I mean, if you listen to any, any record, there's songs on one record that you would never expect would be on the same record. And with the new record, uh, The Story of Light, if you listen to a song like The Story of Light and compare that to Creamsicle Sunset, you'd never expect them to be on the same record. And if you compare those to um, John the Revelator or The Book of the Seven Seals in comparison to um, Weeping China Doll, you know, they're, they're very diverse. I look for dynamics and diversity, but not, not stylistic diversities because uh, I work hard to make sure that the music doesn't sound stylized by any particular genre. So that's the similarities. The difference is, the difference in making a record for me is very similar 
to the differences that a lot of artists have as they go through uh, technical revolutions, you know, because we have seen, I mean, I've been recording for hmm, 32 years now, and uh, technology has evolved, and the way that we make music, uh, you know, falls prey to this technical revolution. Sometimes it's it makes things a lot more convenient, sometimes it, it it can complicate things and sometimes it can give you tools to do things that were just not possible yesterday. And, you know, I, I, I embrace a lot of these tools and uh, so that's how it changes. You know, there's things I can do on The Story of Light that I could never do on Passion and Warfare. Um, and I think that's the same for a lot of artists. All the airport courtesy phone Yeah, the story of light. I actually collaborated um, with Amy Mann on a track, and I, I, I actually don't collaborate much on my solo work. Um, like the last time I actually collaborated in writing a song with somebody um, was on Sex and Religion. It was 20 years ago, and I think it's it's because I've always tried to kind of create uh, a relatively undefinable style of music that's. Um, you know, not diluted by contributions, and you know, I say that in all due respect, and probably that's been to the detriment of any pop culture iconness I may have had the potential to achieve. But it's just, you know, it's my own little bubble, and um, but sometimes I'm I, I'm just compelled, and on this record, um, I had this song, I had this this very this acoustic uh, riff, and I built this track around it. And I was looking to have a uh, female vocalist uh, to do a duet with because um, in the story um, it, it required, you know, to, to reflect that the part of the story, it required that and the subject matter too. Uh, I wrote the first line of this song and it was, the more that I see, the less I know. And then I just hit this block. I couldn't, I couldn't come up with anything else. And... Um, Oddly enough, I went to college at Berkeley College of Music with Amy Mann, and we lived in the same apartment building, just a couple of doors away from each other. And my girlfriend at the time, um, Pia, was really, really good friends with Amy, and actually, Pia's now my wife. Uh, and Pia was actually in a band with Amy, a little band called the Young Snakes. So through the years, you know, they, they were friends, and, and we've always had Amy's music in the house. And there was just something just very you know, endearing about her music. She's a great artist, and and she's she's a poet. You know, and um, her voice. There's something just um, just exquisitely vulnerable, but confident. You know, and uh, when I had had trouble writing these lyrics and looking for a, a female singer that would sing with me, Pia said, "Why don't you call Amy?" And the first thing I thought is, well, she wouldn't be interested in this. Is, she, I mean, Steve Vai is like, you know, so different than Amy Mann. Um, but the track really wasn't off limits, you know, because it, 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 it's a sweet kind of a track, and I could see how maybe it could work if she was interested. And I sent her the track, and she, she uh, liked it and, and wanted to work with me, and it was just so great. It was a really nice collaboration. You know, she wrote all the lyrics, and... Um, came by and, you know, we worked on it and then she came by and, and, and uh, sang it and maybe it's causing me to rethink the idea of collaborating. Well, who's that riding? Who's that riding? Um, and with John the Revelator, I had heard this track, John the Revelator, by Blind Willie Johnson and it was so powerful, you know, very stripped down old recording of a, of a sort of a folk traditional standard and it was just so compelling his voice was like like it was on fire or something and I heard it with thunderous guitars and, and thunder and um, so I built the track around uh, and I used, I used the sample of Blind Willie Johnson and I built the track around what I was hearing and the, the next song that follows it, the Book of the Seven Seals was actually one piece, John the Revelator and the Book of the Seven Seals. And my idea was to create this um, almost like a theatrical piece, 
you know, that was a preposterous theatrical piece with these heavy guitars, but these, you know, these um, traditional kind of, almost traditional vocals on top, gospel, um, you know, things like, um, uh, you know, there's almost like a hokey quality to the second movement because of the vocals. And I just thought that that would be so interesting, you know, these, because the arrangement is, is really beautiful, and there's about 80 vocals on that. Uh, Book of the Seven Seals, and just you know the the contrast between this really great uh, kind of heavy earthy blues thing to this almost you know midwestern very white Republican sounding uh, you know choir, um, and I say that in all due respect. Uh, I just it, it just resonated with me, and I know it sounds kind of hokey and odd, but that was part of the uh, part of the whole picture. But I needed somebody to sing John the Revelator uh, because I, I like to sing, but I know my limitations. And if I would have tried to sing it the way the song needed it, I would have destroyed the song. <laughs> and I just thought, I'll just let the universe provide, you know? And, and um, the day after I finished recording the track, I was hosting this event for Naris, the Academy. Uh, you know, the Grammy folks, and they had a bunch of performers on the bill, and Beverly McClellan, who was a season one finalist on a very popular American TV show called The Voice, took to the stage and just wailed me, man. You know, just stopped me dead in my tracks. I was completely enthralled uh, by the way this, this girl was singing, and just her whole spirit I mean, you, you know, some, some artist that just comes right out of them and hits you right in the face, and, and if, you, if you ever see her perform, you know what I mean. And I thought, that's my singer for John the Revelator. Uh, but again, you know, I thought, well, you know, I don't know if she has any idea who I am or, or is interested in this kind of thing, but uh, I got backstage and she was there. Um, and she said that she gave me one of her CDs and she says, I like your music. And I said, oh yeah, well, guess what? <laughs> And I asked her and I sent her the track and she, she liked the track and felt like she could contribute. And she belted it way out of the park. And, and I'm really happy with the way it came out. Well, you know, I, when I make a record I, I do a lot of the work myself. I produce it, I write the music, I play a lot of the instruments, I, I engineer it. I mix it. I do virtually every aspect of the the record because I, I like I like that. I enjoy it. I, I like engineering. You know, I'm fascinated with gear, what it does, um, and and I, I I like the the decoration of the stereo landscape with the use of things like instrument placement, EQ you know, different timbres and, and stuff like that. It's like it's like painting a picture. And I'm okay at it, you know, I think I'm pretty good. I mean, there's guys that do it all day, and they're really great, but I enjoy the process myself. But there comes a point where when it's done, and I mix it, and when I'm mixing it, I listen very carefully to other con contemporary type, you know, music of its sorts to make sure that I'm in the ballpark with certain things like bottom end and stuff like that. But the final stage, I don't, I don't do it the mastering stage because I have to get away from it you know I need to bring it to somebody that really knows that does this kind of thing every day and knows how to add just the right amount of compression to make the record loud enough but not destroy the dynamic range and you know the right EQ and the right converters I don't even care to own that stuff because it's it's a different world the mastering world and Bernie Grumman has done my records because for me, he's just the best, you know, he's, he's been doing it longer than anybody I know. He yeah. still loves doing it. He has yeah. all this phenomenal handcrafted gear that you just, you, you could never buy. And as a result, you get all the things that you want to hear in a finished product, the dynamic range, the loudness, the, um, you know, the right air and the top end. He has these techniques of tightening up bottom end so that it's bigger but cleaner. He's a very, very uh, amazing guy. So I don't touch that process and never have. 
I give it to Bernie. <laughs> uh, you know, it's funny. I have so many guitars and so many amplifiers and all this stuff, but I just can't help going to my go-to instruments that bring me comfort and warmth. <clears throat> and um, on this record, Evo, I used my, my Ibanez gem that I call Evo, probably 60% mm, of the tracks. And there's one track that I used, no, no, it's two, three. There's three tracks that I use flow. Um, Molokachi, the seventh song, is all flow because of the sustainer and such, and uh, Valorum is flow. Um, and then the other percentage of the record, I used various guitars for textures. So I didn't want to just use the same guitar for, you know, some rhythm parts and some, uh, uh, you know, background things here and there. So I, I've used a, a variety of guitars, but uh, those two guitars seem to just be the, you know, my left arm and my right arm. Well, my thoughts on contemporary instrumental guitar music is that um, it's, it may be more of a subculture right now than it was back when, uh, like in the 70s, when Jeff Beck was coming out with these beautiful instrumental guitar records. Or when Joe Satriani came out with Surfing with the Alien and all of all of these two artists' catalogs, the reasons why I think the reason why instrumental guitar music is brought into the forefront is the same reason why any music is brought into the forefront. It's when an artist comes along that does it and connects with people, you know. And the two artists I just mentioned, just to name a few, their music is very accessible. You know, it's very um, approachable and it's very listenable, you know. Um, there's a larger audience for it because it, uh, it's easier to listen to. Um, but there's always a subculture of instrumental guitar players that are doing amazing things. It's just a smaller segment, but the people who are doing it are just as creative and just as passionate. I mean, you can never say that Alan Holdsworth is any more or less of an effective guitar player than, you know, um, you know, a lot of others. You know, I mean, I mean, in my world, he's probably the most effective uh, as far as his technical skill and his his ideas of harmony and stuff. You know, he's just a, a he's remarkable, really. Um, but he, you know, he doesn't sell records like uh, Jeff Beck because it's not as accessible. I don't really listen to a lot of instrumental rock guitar music, um, even though a, a good portion of what I do is that. But um, there are some, you know, like I say, underground movements uh, that are very interesting. Um, there's a band, Animals as Leaders, with Tosin Abasi, and he uh, is doing really interesting things with like an eight-string guitar, um, some very interesting harmonic structures and uh, rhythms. He's got these polymetric things going on that are baffling, but they groove, you know? But it's very aggressive uh, music, in a sense. So, um, you know, it, it, it'll find its audience, and it has, but it's just not a popular audience. And the state of instrumental guitar playing will explode again when somebody comes along and reinvents the genre. You know, I've always been uh, interested and fascinated with the business of music. You know, working with Frank Zappa, I learned about independence and how to protect yourself. And I learned about the music business, virtually all aspects of it. Um, I've always felt very um, protective of my intellectual property. And uh, starting the label was really, uh, you know, um, starting my label, Favorite Nations, was really in response to the lopsidedness of the conventional record deal and how it, how it, um, how it affects artists that um, are very artistic, maybe very musician-oriented, that do have an audience, but have a challenge getting it to them sometimes because they're not really big numbers. So um, I decided to walk the walk 
and I started the label based on a um, a 50-50 profit share with the artists, which is very unconventional. Uh, you know, and this was in hopes to let these very um, uh, visionary kinds of players create the thing that they're really passionate about, get it out there in the world. It's really no, not brain surgery. You make deals with distributors, you manufacture it, and you ship it, and you get paid. You know, I mean, um, and it's easy. Stuff like that just was, was very obvious and easy to me. I mean, there's, there's more to it, but, you know, that's ba basic premise. But a lot of artists, you know, they have different brain muscles and they don't want to deal with any of that stuff. Um, so it was a home for artists of that nature to, you know, I mean, uh, very creative, very, you know, um, set in what they want to do. Uh, to make their music, get it out, maybe not sell boatloads of records, but make enough money to eat well and make another record out until, um, you know, the, the conventional model of the record industry just changed. But we've been able to actually look around the corner and make lemonade out of lemons, as they say. And um, I've created a digital uh, distribution network. Um, I myself was independent until um, you know got to the point where it was very difficult to tour and do everything that I wanted to do as an artist and I, I signed to a small label called Relativity for way back for Passion and Warfare and I had, I had a, a very fair deal uh, and then Sony purchased Relativity so my deal went with Sony and in the and I had some great years with Sony you know um, there's a lot of, you know, I was fortunate to work with a lot of creative people, and Sony is, has a lot of muscle, and they're a big label, and they have, you know, divisions all around the world, and I, I, I um, you know, I cultivated relationships with some of these people, and, uh, you know, you can say what you will about a big label, but a lot of times, you know, they're very organized, and they know how to get the records in the stores and to the proper consumer. I have a very special deal with some of the Sony affiliates now because I'm not uh, a signed artist. I'm a label that does distribution with them and as a result I can work with them on marketing and stuff like that uh, because I'm paying for it. But, you know, the, the deals are different. So it works really well. And, and uh, I like the feeling of being independent and working with a major. Well, it's, it's, it's been a while since I've done a whole show, a whole solo show. I don't know how it has been five years, probably because I just get so interested in other things. But, you know, I, I, I woke up one day and I said, wow, I, I really want to, you know, get on the road. I love touring. And I was on the road, but with different situations. And now I felt it was time to put my band together. And when I put a show together, you know, it's, it's kind of like, um, I guess the way maybe a chef looks at a recipe you know, they know that if they put this in there, it's going to taste like this at the end of the day. So I, I try to create a nice balance of dynamic songs that, um, you know, are dense, very light, very fast, very slow, you know. And uh, I pulled from my catalog a lot of material. There's some favorites in there, I think. And uh, I'm playing more new stuff than, you know, uh, is conventionally put into a set from an artist. I think we're doing like six songs off the new record. It's because they're really fun to play, um, and it, it's uh, you go out on tour and then you kind of shift the set list around and you rebalance a few things. You feel it out, and we we really didn't have to do much of that. I mean, we're into like our tenth show, and I think I took one song out because my shows can go like three hours sometimes, and I I just didn't want that, you know, because um, it's you know, it's too much sometimes for some people. <laughs> So I wanted to, you know, the show started out at 2 hours 20, and I just trimmed a couple of things, and I think we're down to about, uh, you know, 2.10, 2.15 now, and that, that feels comfortable for me. I had an amazing time on the G3 Australian tour. I mean amazing. It was so much fun. You know, to be with Joe and Steve, Steve Lukather. Oh my gosh! And um, I think it's working kind of nicely because uh, when you go to a place, a particular country like Australia, <coughs> you 
you can't just go back the next month, you know. Maybe some people can, but I, I can't, you know. Uh, it's like a saturation thing. But I haven't brought the full show, my full show, to uh, Australia in quite some time. And I'm definitely planning on it. It'll probably be mid next year. And I'm really excited about it. And um, I think that it's, it's a really enjoyable show for the people that like what I do. So I hope to see you there. Thanks.